I, 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 I don't know, call it feeling sorry for them. You know, there's such little bitty things just going about their business and, and they're just persecuted in, in their natural environment or of which there is no more. And, and so I, I said, you know, if, if I want to work with tortoises, if I want to, I want to feel that gratification, a purpose, a reason for doing it. And when I do something, I have to do it a hundred percent, as you can see, um, that's where I need to go. And then the next mission was to find them, highways. The first thing they did was put in highways. And when they put in highways, they put telephone poles along the highways for power lines. The birds would line up on the power lines. And as soon as they saw a little baby Egyptian, which is only an inch long, they'd zoom down and, and snag it. Uh, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but that was, you know, part of the process. Uh, this is crushed coral. It's like almost pea gravel, real fine gravel. It is 100% calcium. So uh, if you you put fresh crushed coral in for substrate, especially the little guys, you watch them, they look like cattle all with their head down, picking through it to find little tiny pieces of it to ingest. Welcome to episode number 89 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you as always for tuning in today. If you are looking for more information on the podcast, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you'll find show notes for all the episodes that have been recorded. If you would like to support the show, you can head to animalsathome.ca slash shop and pick yourself up a t-shirt or a sweater. $5 is automatically donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Or you could join us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash animalsathome. There you have access, early access to episodes as well as the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description box as well as on the show notes. So as always, if you're in the market for new reptile equipment, I definitely recommend going to check them out or just bookmark that page so you can go back when you are in need of some new equipment. All right, let's jump into today's episode. So today I'm speaking with Ralph Till. Ralph is a tortoise keeper, but he specializes in the Egyptian tortoise, which is a critically endangered species. And there are very few people working with the species in captivity. And he happens to be one of the premier breeders in the United States. Ralph has been working with the species for 15 years and been breeding them for about 10 years. And in the episode, we discuss everything from the husbandry of this species, why they're endangered, and what his goal is overall with working with this species. Now, this is one of those episodes where if you are involved in herpetoculture and you're really looking for the next step and you want something to be a little more fulfilling than just caring for your animals, this episode will give you a good roadmap of how to do that. Ralph really walks us through why he chose to work with a critically endangered species and sort of the passion and the fulfillment he gets out of caring for an animal that is really facing the end of its wild existence on the planet, which is really a sad thing. Of course, Ralph walks us through the breeding operation he has and how he goes about breeding these tortoises. And we also discuss the creation of the Tampa Bay Turtle and Tortoise Society. Now, at two points in the podcast, Ralph actually is kind enough to hold up a fresh Egyptian tortoise hatchling for the camera. So if you are listening to this on the audio version on iTunes or Spotify or whatnot, I will make sure those are time stamped on the YouTube video. So listen to it as you are. If you're in the car working out, it won't affect your listening experience, but you can go back to the YouTube video later and then find those timestamps so you can see the cute little tortoise. All right, let's jump into this episode. Enjoy. Well, Ralph, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for reaching out as well. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm happy to have this conversation. I think part of the podcast is I'm always looking for, for lack of a better word, reasons to justify keeping captive animals. You know, that's one of the the speed bumps we must come up sort of get over is, you know, come up with a good reason for why it's okay to do this, why there's some ethical reasons. And I think you, behind you, you have some great reasons and we're going to get into that as well. But I want to talk about how you got into this. How how did you become a reptile keeper, a tortoise keeper in the first place? Well, my, my, to go back in the beginning of time, I guess, uh, as a kid, I was fortunate enough to live out in the, in farm country Mm. and, and, so I had access to ponds and swamps and streams and everything, uh, what every reptile you can imagine during the summer. And I always gravitated towards turtles. Now, we didn't have tortoises where I lived. I'm up from northwestern New Jersey uh, originally. Uh, but we had turtles, every kind of turtle you could dream of, native stuff. And 
that was my fascination. And I kept a lot. I mean, I, I caught them, I, obviously. I built ponds. I built habitats. I built all kinds of things to, to keep them. But then fast forward, uh, life interfered. You know, you, you, you grow up, you get married, you have other responsibilities. And ultimately wound up in Florida some 35 years ago. And, and knowing that this was a reptile oasis, yeah. okay? And so I, I started to pursue it again. And then originally it was the typical red foots and yellow foots and Herman's tortoises, all the easy stuff to get. And then eventually I, I, I thought that, you know, it was nice to have them, but it's really going nowhere. I wanted to, personally, I wanted to work with something that I felt I can make a difference with. And, and that was my whole motivation to get involved with the Egyptian tortoise. So where, do you think, <laughs> where did that come? Why do you think you had that sense to want to do something a little bit deeper? Was it just because you were looking for more fulfillment than just simply caring for, for the tortoises? For me personally, you know, I, I, had a, I had a yard full of, again, red foots and, and I had, I had two of this and one of that, three of the other. And yeah, I had a nice collection, but it was, it was like, all I was doing was feeding them. You know, there was just no purpose. And, and I read, I read a lot of stuff. And of course the internet came to life, you know, and I, I kind of pecked my way through that. And, and the, and the, the one species that attracted me the most or that I was attracted to the most was either a Galapagos tortoise or an Egyptian tortoise. <laughs> and I said, well, I really can't have a yard full of Galapagos tortoises. You know, it's, I live in a residential area, so that's not going to work. So the, the Egyptians fascinated me with their size or lack of their little bitty things the hardships that they endure and, and, and the, and the status of them in the wild. And I said, you know, here's a species that I can work with that I can, in my own way, create my own assurance colony. And I mean, I dreamed about being able to take 50 of them and releasing them into the wild. That's not going to happen, but, but, uh, that's where I get my gratification. Yeah. So how did how did that process start? Did you like you said you have the Galapagos or the Egyptian, which are the a total opposite sides of the spectrum as far as size goes? <laughs> so were you out going out and sort of hunting for a species that you found to be critically endangered or or hurting in the wild somewhere, or did you just kind of start with those two options and then find out that you know they're both endangered? Well. Once again, like I said, I had the, the Redfoots and I had a few Hermans and I had a few Greeks and, and the, they, were, they were available in pet shops. They were available everywhere and, and people treated them terribly and they let them go. And when I saw this Egyptian tortoise, I, 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 I don't know, call it feeling sorry for him. You know, there's such little bitty things just going about their business and, and they're just persecuted in, in their natural environment or of which there is no more. And, and so I said, you know, if, if I want to work with tortoises, if I want to, I want to feel that gratification, a purpose, a reason for doing it. And when I do something, I have to do it a hundred percent, as you can see, um, that's where I need to go. And then the next mission was to find them. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So what, how did that process go about searching for these guys? Well, it, it turned out to be a lot more difficult than, than what I anticipated. Uh, now, we're talking 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. There were only some wild-caught specimens in the country. Uh, they had a very, very high mortality rate, especially males. Uh, the animals were being brought in in, in in boxes of 100, and by the time they reached their de final destination, which prospective owners, they were down to 10 or 15, I mean, the, the die-off was terrible. Fortunately, there were a few individuals that, that acquired some, 
and and uh, were very diligent, very conscientious, and managed to keep them alive, and then started to uh, to breed them. Every now and then, one would pop up on one of the like a king snake mm-hmm. ad or something like that. Or you'd go to a show like Daytona, the Daytona Expo, and and a few would show up there for sale and got to chat with the the seller. You know, are you the breeder? Are you just selling them? And and, and just kind of traced it from there. So how much would an Egyptian tortoise cost 15 years ago? Probably $300. Okay. So that seems... That's a, yeah, that's a but a but you know but they were they were expensive then, but three hundred dollars is nine hundred dollars today. Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so it's kind of all relative. So then, as far as their their native range, like you're saying, it's being decimated or pretty much destroyed. What's going on there? Why are they endangered? Uh, habitat destruction. I mean, it's the same habitat. old. Yeah, poaching for the wild, uh, habitat destruction. You know the the. the Highways. The first thing they did was put in highways. And when they put in highways, they put telephone poles along the highways for power lines. The birds would line up on the power lines. And as soon as they saw a little baby Egyptian, which is only an inch long, they'd zoom down and and snag it. Mm. Uh, You know, it doesn't sound like much, but that was, you know, part of the process. Well, I was looking at their native range earlier today, and it is quite small to begin with. They don't have a huge band of of territory that they would normally be in anyway. So any sort of habitat destruction there is going to decimate the population. So as far as, you know, you were saying, obviously we can't release 50 back into the wild or whatnot. Is, Is that mostly because, you know, it's easier said than done. We can't rewilding is a much more difficult and much more involved process than I think many of us think at first, but also is it mostly because the actual habitat is no longer there for these animals to exist in? Twofold. Uh, one, most of the habitat is not there anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very thin range. If, if you actually study the map, you'll see that from the coast inland, it's maybe 30 miles, give or take a few miles. And that's their total range. You know, it it parallels the whole coastline of of Egypt uh, into Libya. Uh, Most of that has either been developed or or commercialized for uh, crops and things of that nature or grazing land. And then the other is that the pet trade in in Europe has such an insatiable demand for these things that the the poachers are, are following it. I mean, to this day in Libya, where that's the only place they're still found is a, a few pockets of them in Libya, and they, they're poaching them out of there by the truckload as we speak. Yeah, and see, that is the disappointing side of the reptile trade that I think many of us try to be willfully blind to. It's like, yeah. you know, that still happens and with sort of complete disregard to the wildlife. So Total disregard, yeah. And it's it's such a shame. And so as far as your goal then with the species, is it mostly just to have that sort of satellite Noah's Ark or, you know, to ha- at least perpetuate the species on the earth, even though we can't introduce them back into the wild? Well, as I, I wrote an article a few years ago, and when I concluded the article, I, I made a statement. I said that we are their only future. Mm-hmm. So it's it's imperative that do we do what we can to to. Uh, you know, extend their 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 life on this planet yeah. because they have no future in the wild. So yes, what I now I didn't start out with the sole intent of creating this big breeding colony and and distributing hatchlings all over the place. That wasn't the original intent, but it's just morphed into that. Mm-hmm. And um, in my own way. I, I, I feel that I've created my own, uh, uh, what do you call them? SSP yeah. <laughs> group, you know, species, a species survival plan. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, I work with others that I try and place hatchlings with others who I feel will follow the same, uh, goal that I have, maybe not to the same degree and that's fine, but, uh, that they'll eventually put together their own group to, and to uh, perpetuate the species, yeah. And this is one thing that I love about herpetoculture is that 
you know, keepers do essentially, like you're saying, come up with their SSP. And when, you know, we were talking about Anthony, Pier- Anthony Pierleone before this, and he actually had, I think the Spangler eye was part of an actual species survival plan. They yeah. actually, and yeah. I think things are changing a little bit with the, the AZ, or, AZ, or the, what is it called? The aquarium? AZA. Yeah. AZA, yeah. AZA. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that maybe they're kind of falling out of that, but at the same time, it doesn't stop keepers from essentially establishing something like that. Yeah, well, the, and I don't want to get into politics. The, the AZA is a great thing, okay? Uh, unfortunately, it's, 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 it's only real affiliation with, with what we know, what we do with the zoo stuff. I mean, there are 100% zoos and other zoos. The private industry, the private keepers, chances are have a lot more animals than a lot of the AZA institutions. Mm-hmm. And, and most of the private keepers are willing to work with zoos or willing to work with the AZA. The AZA is not so much willing to work with the private sector. I, yeah. I don't know why, uh, but it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it seems like they sort of turn their nose up to private keepers. Yeah. Just keep yeah. Uh, I mean, I know some zookeepers uh, that, that address uh, the care of Egyptians in their collections at their facilities. And they're great people. And every now and then I'll get a text message or an email or something. I'll say, Hey, Ralph, you know, we're, can you give me a tip about doing this or that? And, and I'll say, yeah, sure. I said, show me a picture of what you have. Well, policy says I can't do that. Really? Then uh, that's what I said. Really? <laughs> you know? And I said, I, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to do what I can to assist you. But you you can't. I, I don't mean that individual can't. Policy can't. Right. It's just closed book, in, in other words. Yeah, which is, I think, a shame because I think the, the private sector could offer a lot, a lot. Well, and that's what I always think, too. The, the private sector has an amazing amount of information. There's people that are working with species a lot of times species are bred for the first time in the private spe- sector because I always say this, you know, keepers who are keeping privately have no red tape really. And they, they kind of have an un- unlimited budget in some ways where they don't have to go through all these processes to try to get approval. They can yeah, just work yeah. with the species and then learn it. And a yeah. lot of times, like you say, it, zoos will come to keepers and, and try to pry that information out. And it would be much better if those that information would flow both ways a lot easier. Do you ever have zoos or anything? I mean, other than coming to you for care advice, what about for animals? I, I don't have any zoo animals. I've actually reached out to a couple of zoos that I knew that were uh, producing a few mm. because uh, one of the things that I strive to do is mix up the genetics. Right. Uh, you know, that's very important. And they, uh, again, it's a closed book. Mm. There yeah. used to be, there used to be a stud book for Egyptians and and I have those records. I have copies of those records, and and what zoo had what animal, uh, as far as stud book registered to mix up all the genetics. Uh, sadly, it, it appears that it's just fallen by the wayside. Uh, whoever was managing it is no more, and it never got passed on. Are there quite a few private keepers breeding this species? Uh. I'm going to say no. Mm. I mean, yes, there are private keepers. There's a few that are very successful. Um, there's there's a lot of people that have two or three of these animals, and and they have very very little success with breeding them. Well, because it, it does kind of make me worry. It, it, it's nice to hear when you have keepers who are like yourself, who are you know in, interested in having a stud book and and keeping the genetics mixed up. I always get worried when I see you know hobbyist breeders who just go buy a, a pair from the same breeder and then immediately you know four or five years later start breeding and completely b- bottleneck a species. So yep. is there a, a bit of a barrier of entry as far as breeding goes? Like is it a little bit more challenging? Thankfully, for me. Just, just in general, like could the regular, just sort of the average Joe hobbyist pick up a pair and then have success with this species? Like, is do you foresee genetic bottlenecking being an issue eventually with Egyptian tortoises? Uh, 
Uh, genetically, no. I, I don't. I don't think it would be uh, an issue. That's more of a a personal thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm all for it. I, I subscribe to the to mixing up the gene pool as much as possible. But could a a uh, you know a first timer? Let's just call him a first timer, an amateur, whatever. Have a pair of them and breed them successfully. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's no reason in the world why they couldn't. I mean, yeah. that's how I started. Yeah. So tell me a little bit before we get, I want to get into breeding as well, but let's talk about just the, the husbandry in general. Like what are, what are you doing with these? How do you care for them just on a basic skeleton level? Well, they have needs, obviously. Uh, you know, they come from a, a, a different part of the world than what we're used to here in Florida. So you you have to re- at least I did. I researched it first. I researched the, the the weather, the climate, you know, the seasonal changes, the uh, humidity or lack of humidity, and diet. Uh, I got very very fortunate in that I was introduced to a gentleman who had acquired some of those original wild caught animals, you know, forty years ago or thirty five years ago, and. And he was one of the few that kept that group alive. And that group started to breed and he expanded it. And, and so uh, he, he kind of laid the foundation for a lot of what is available in the country today, unknowingly, but he did. I had the great fortune of being introduced to this guy. And we have since become very, very good friends. He's a, a mentor of mine. Uh, So that helped me a lot. We disagreed on a few husbandry things. And I said, why don't you study the weather where they're from? Come on, you're a smart guy. You know, they don't like snow and ice. (laughs) And (laughs) so, so I, I, when I created my enclosures, that's what I based it on was the weather patterns in their native country. I had a I had to change things around. I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. This room that we're in is climate controlled. I can main, uh, uh, I say climate control for temperature. It's uh, I can semi regulate the humidity. Being in Florida, humidity is high. Humidity is not a problem. All right. What we try and do is lower the humidity. Right. Other places have no humidity. Yeah, like that's what I'm trying to to add humidity, you know. Uh, So uh, in their native range, they live on the coastal regions of the Mediterranean, the southern Mediterranean Sea. Very, very humid in the morning. There's a like a, a, a mist or a dew that comes in off the Mediterranean inland for however many miles, 10, 20, 30 miles. So in the morning, everything is covered with dew, and that's their source of moisture. Uh, so I need to kind of recreate that. Now, I don't have a fogging machine, but it's already, you know, 70, 70 80 percent humidity in the morning. And, uh, and then all the lights come on, all the, the UVB come on, all the heat lamps come on. And just like in the wild, it dries it all out. So by 10 o'clock, all that is dried up, just like in the wild. So you don't have to do any work for that. You just let it kind of naturally build up over the night, the humidity build up just by the... I let it overnight, yep. Yeah. I let it do what it does. And then the lights just burn it off and, and dry it up. The lights will burn it off. Now, I you know I have the air, uh, air conditioning, so uh, you know, I need to keep the temperature somewhat comfortable for me. Yeah. I mean, with all the lights on, it could get a hundred degrees in here in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, easily. How, how? What temperatures w- will the actual tortoises be kept at? Like, what's their? I see you have some obviously heat bulbs behind. How hot do those hot spots get? Um, hundred degrees, maybe. Oh, okay. Just right under the heat lamp, though, and the rest of the enclosure is maybe uh, 80, 85 during okay. the day. And I guess mainly just because of the humidity, they can't. You can't keep these guys outside. I know you have other tortoises outside, but these ones, it has to be mainly because of the humidity. I assume. You know, I, I've never attempted it here, and again because of the humidity, 
Um, I'm sure at night and in the morning, it would be fine. Um, typically what they do in the wild is find a clump of grass or something and crawl, you know, kind of dig their way under it and hide during the day. It may be okay. Um, I'm just, I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to risk that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And since they are small, they can a control kind of a freak. So (laughs) you like to keep those metrics in line. Yeah. Yeah. I I can control it in here. I can't control it out there. So, well, and since they are such a small tortoise, it's pretty easy to have them inside. You can have a pretty fair, fair size enclosure inside without having to be like taking up a giant part of your room. All my, all my enclosures measure, uh, uh, 48 inches by 18 inches, but that's surface area by either 16 or 18 inches high. Mm-hmm. And as you can see, maybe in the background, it's they're stacked three high. Yeah. Yeah. And I and, built them all. I built every single one of these. Yeah, I was going to ask. Those are all hand built. Everything, every everything in here, I built with exception of one plastic tub. Yeah, I built them all. Yeah, that's that's the way to do it. It's cheaper, and if you're the one that built it, you know how it goes together. And yeah, you know, so you I, I number one, I enjoy doing it, and yeah. and two, uh, I I have them designed. Uh, maintenance is a big maintenance and management are two buzzwords with me. The way I have them designed, they're all on wheels. Every single unit is on wheels. So I can I can pull one plug and roll one of those units out into the rest of the garage and empty it out, clean it all out, hose it out, wash it, turn it upside down, whatever I need to do, do a little maintenance on it, and then roll it back in and put one plug in and it's up and running again. Yeah. I mean, any anything you can do to reduce all of the labor, it makes it a lot more enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. So how many Egyptian tortoises do you have in your colony? What is the size of this colony? I have uh, 15 adults. Well, actually 14 adults. Uh, uh, 5.9. 5 okay. males, 9 females. Adults. Okay. Do they... And then I have, I have numerous, numerous hatchlings every year. I average about 25 hatchlings per year. What, what's the average clutch size? Two. Two. Oh, okay. That's just small. Yep. And they're, they'd be tiny babies as well because it's just amazing how small that tortoise is. Do they need to go through any sort of like estivation or a, like a brumation period? Do you do any like temperature cycling like that? Oh, there's a baby right there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's about a month old. Wow. That is <laughs> tiny. Yeah. And he's grown considerably. They grow like mad when they're little babies. He's already, he's probably grown a half of an inch. See, you can see how that would be a very popular pet for the pet trade because they are so small. But they're also very, very vulnerable at that size. Okay. And, and um, yeah, they, they're, they're popular because they're small and they're cute. But they, they have, at least in my world here, uh, very specific needs as hatchlings and... They're, they're not as uh, resilient as some of your more popular species, your, your big, you know, like redfoots and sulcatas and that. When they reach adulthood, are they much hardier? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, full grown. The largest animal I have here is a female who is just five inches long and weighs 420 grams. Wow. And that's a big girl. That's the largest one I have. And how old is she? About 10. 10. And yeah. do they have this sort of typical like 40, 50 year lifespan? Well, we don't know for certain. We know okay. 40. Okay. We know, uh, we know that they can live to be 40 because uh, uh, myself and my friend, my mentor friend, he's got those wild caught ones and he still has his original wild caught group. Wow. And they were adults when he got them in 1994. So they're still uh, there. Uh, they've amazing. stopped producing. I will say that. Uh, they've aged out as far as producing any eggs, but the animals are still healthy and going strong. Wow. That's amazing. So we don't know how much older 
I mean, there's document, not documentation, but articles written, people say 50, 60, 80 years. I, I don't know of anybody that's really had one that long. Yeah. Time will tell. Time will tell. So do you do any uh, temperature cycling through the season as far as do they go through an estivation period or, or hibernation or anything like that? Uh, they do not hibernate. But what happens in the summer, uh, they do kind of go into a, a, a semi-estivation. Okay. In their native range, of course, it gets extremely hot, you know, 100 degrees. So they'll come out in the morning uh, when the dew is on the ground, you know, they'll forage. Uh, forage, uh, uh, you know, lick droplets off leaves and that for moisture. And then as the sun comes up, they'll just find a clump of grass or something to hide under. Here in captivity, they 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 kind of emulate the same thing. I provide them with hide boxes. And and every single one starting about now, I see one, one female was out. I don't know. The rest of them were already probably starting to hide. Um, They'll, they'll hide for the day and then later, maybe six o'clock this afternoon or this evening, some of them will come out. Now that's in the summer. In the winter time when it's cold, um, it doesn't ever get icy cold where they live. Right. Uh, it may have, you know, they may have a little cold snap like here in Florida, you know, once in a while it go into the thirties. Uh, they're very active. They're actually quite active and they come out, they'll bask. And then forage, forage, you know, half the day at least. So yeah, so their slowdown period is really during the the heat of the the of heat the of the summer. Yeah, yeah. And as far as eating goes, are they uh, they're vegetarian? What are you feeding them? Yeah, herbivore, hundred uh, percent. What I use is uh, collard greens, uh, chicory, escarole. Red leaf lettuce, green leaf lettuce. Uh, oh gosh, I forgot the list. But uh, all the all your Just common the basic greens, greens, all your yeah. common salad, and I and I I chop it up, spring mix, throw that in there. Dandelion greens, curly endive. I chop it up into a huge toss salad, and and I put it into a big plastic tub and just store it in there. And it's like going to a going to a restaurant, going to the salad bar. It's a big toss salad mixed with everything. Yeah. And I just give them each, uh, each animal a measured amount. And, and, uh, you know, one day it may be, maybe by chance it'll have two pieces of everything. Maybe it'll have 10 pieces of collard and two pieces of this, just how every it's mixed up. Yeah. So it just becomes varied just by virtue of the mixed salad method. Yeah. Yeah. How I mixed it. And, uh, I've been doing that for years. It's, it's worked really, really great for me. Uh, I try and keep everything as natural as possible once a week. And I, I can't emphasize this enough. Once a week, I give them some uh, like Missouri tortoise chow. I'll soak up a bit of it. And, and, and uh, I actually hide it under the salad. And they'll, they'll dig right through the salad to get to it. They, they love that stuff. But I only feed it to them once a week. I and don't want to put them too dependent upon uh, on commercial food. Not that it's bad. I just I just don't want to go that route. And do you do you do it once a week so they do have access to more minerals and vitamins or or what's yeah? Your there's a few there's a few ingredients in there that I want them to have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you supplement otherwise? Do you, is there any powdered supplement that you sprinkle on the salad or do they just they're good to go? I use uh, I use cuttle bone. Mm-hmm. Regular cuddle bone. I buy them in bulk. Just break it up and toss it around in the enclosure. Um, once in a while, I'll sprinkle a little bit of uh, Reptivite with D3 yeah. on it, but not a whole lot. I'm not a big fan of of, of piling up um, of powdered supplements. Yeah, you know they don't they don't get it in the wild. You know, if, if they if they had a jar full of calcium in the wild that they ate every day, then so be it. But, <laughs> yeah. but they don't, you yeah. know. They'll so, chew on the cuddle bone and, and whatnot, and that's how they're going to get But they'll chew there. on anything, on, on deer antlers and dog bones and cow bones <laughs> and pieces of rock and whatever they can chew on, you know. Yeah. And then plus you have the UV light, so they're getting their vitamin D there. I have UV, yeah. 
Lots what, of UV. <laughs> was that ever? I, I, I'm very fairly unfamiliar with tortoises. I know that most people keep UV, but was there ever a, a people not using UV and just supplementing with D3 instead? Sure. Way back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Uh, you know, UV was the was the unknown. Mm. Uh, people used the black lights, the the grow lights over uh, like you used for plants in aquariums. Yeah, yeah. You know, didn't even know what UV was. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, true. Yeah, really. So, so yeah. So people try to supplement with diet. I mean, it, diet is important. It's real important. Um, hydration is real, real important. Um, but yeah, now with, with a little, uh, you know, technology, we've learned more about UV, so we utilize it. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what about substrate? I, I see that sort of like crushed rock. It's white. What are you using there? I, I use, it's a, it's like coral, crushed coral. Oh, okay. It's called oyster shell. Mm. All right. But there's a difference between oyster shell and crushed coral, oyster shell in itself. I mean, you've seen oyster shells and when you crush it up, it's, it's flat, sharp, jagged edges. All yeah. right. Uh, this is crushed coral. It's like almost pea gravel, real fine gravel. It is 100% calcium. So, uh, if you, you put fresh crushed coral in for substrate, especially the little guys, you watch them, they look like cattle all with their head down, picking through it to find little tiny pieces of it to ingest. So, so it, works and then out. it just dissolves. Yeah. So they can get their calcium from that as well. And, and they get it yeah. naturally as they want it. Hmm, you know, sense. a lot of people, again, you, you asked about, about sprinkling on, uh, uh, additional stuff. Let's say you put a nice uh, fresh salad in there, and I usually spritz a little water on it for a little little moisture content, and then you shake all kinds of vitamins or calcium on it. They can't help but ingest this big gob of this stuff. Yeah, because whether they want it or not, it's 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 adhered to their food, and and uh, I I think it causes more problems. Than what you're trying to to achieve. Well, that's Perform. the amazing thing about living bodies is the ability to crave what they need. And I mean, we do it as well. If you're craving salt, you're probably low on sodium. And if you know, I'm yeah, sure yeah. the tortoises know when they're craving calcium, and they can do it themselves. But if you mix it yeah. in with their food so much that you're right, they can't separate it. They can't separate it. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and then you have to you have to be careful that they don't get bound up with. Um, uh, urates, excess urates. Yeah. And then if they get excess urates and not enough hydration, um, they'll, they'll form, you know, look like an egg. I've, I've had animals that I've taken in from other, I, I don't want to call them collectors, but let's just say I've acquired some animals from other sources. Yeah. And, and I soaked them and, and they pass out this, you know, it looked like an egg. It was so big. Just pure calcium urates. Just pure urates, yeah. hard crystallized urates. You know. Yeah, so it's better to let them figure it out on their own. Just give them the option. And, That's and, the way I do it. You know, if if and, and then another byproduct of chewing on the the cuddle bone is it grinds down their beak, so you right. don't get the overgrown beak. Mm -hmm. I, I I can't tolerate that. I think that's that that's a sure sign of poor husbandry when you have an animal with an overgrown beak. So as far as overgrown beaks go, do you ever have to do any trimming yourself or just because they have nope. the cuddle bone in there, it's all done naturally? Never, never. I've never, ever, ever had to do it. Yeah. So I guess- On, you... on any of mine, again, I've I've acquired a couple of animals over the years and and yeah, I've had to do some, uh, I've had to do some maintenance, if you will. Yeah. But yeah, it, that, that, that makes sense. So even- doing the maintenance if someone's getting the beak trimmed every couple of months or something by the vet, you're still missing a component there. You should, you shouldn't Absolutely. have to do that. Yeah. 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 You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, the diet isn't right. The animal is not getting what it needs. It's getting what you want it to have. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's a mistake. So as far as breeding goes, do you cohab them at all or are they just paired together for breeding? I keep all my adult breeders individual. Okay. Okay. 
I'm, I'm very adamant about that. Are there people think I'm nuts, but I keep them all as individuals all the time. Um, I can, I, I keep records. I, I, I identify each animal. I know where it came from. I know its source. I know its history. And so when, when breeding season comes around, which is usually around October. All right. Uh, I can, I can take, uh, male number one and put it with female number seven. And what I do first is I put some of the males together and, and, and they fight. Uh, they get each other riled up. You'll see them ramming and beating and banging and nipping at each other. They, yeah, there's they're a video feisty. somewhere, I think, of your. I'll, I'll post yeah, it in the show I notes. I put a video out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, and I'll put I that in the show notes. I got all kinds of flack for that. Oh, really? But, oh, my God. Yeah, you know, why would you leave them? Why would you let them fight like that? They're going to kill each other. That's inhumane. And the reality is they were together for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> But that's but part of the process, right? That's it's part of the process. That's, that's where what the they hormones do in come the in. Wild. Yeah. And 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 then so then I take the, you know, the the I pick them up, his little feet are going 100 miles an hour, and I place them in with female whatever, uh, predetermined, and I leave him in there for a few days, and he'll pursue her relentlessly for several days and and mount her as many times as he can, as many times as she will allow, I guess. And, uh, and then I remove them yeah. because, you know, once they're successfully bred, I don't want to leave them in there to just, you know, cause her undue stress. Yeah. They're just, he's just going to, and then she might not even carry the clutch if he's been, you know, stressing. She may. Out. That's right. That's yeah. right. So, uh, and it's a process that I kind of stumbled upon years ago and it has worked remarkably well here. What age are they breeders at? Uh, it's more of a weight thing. Oh, okay. Minimum is five. Five years. Minimum okay. age is five years. I don't breed any female under five years of age. Hmm. Um, I just don't. I don't care how big she is. Yeah. But uh, weight is the key thing because uh, I wait until they're at least 300 grams in weight. And because you don't know how many eggs that they'll they'll uh, they'll carry, I've had several females deliver clutches of four eggs. Now you take an animal that weighs three hundred grams, and it and it produces forty grams worth of eggs. Yeah, percentage wise, that's you know, crazy. that's a lot of volume. <laughs> yeah, that's ins that's insane. And so I want that animal to be healthy. Uh, I know people that keep their animals together. I know of females that have produced eggs that weigh 220 grams. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm dead set against it. I, I think it's wrong. It's like a 10 year old girl getting pregnant, you know, yeah. it's, and if I, I just don't subscribe to that, but that's their business. I, yeah. I can't control that. Well, well there is, in in many of the different species that are kept in herpetoculture, there is a lack of patience for many people. Even I mean, you look at a all the, the snakes; it's just crazy. People are breeding these snakes six months old, like not females, yep. but males yep. are breeding at six months. It's just like we have to be more patient and make sure that you know there's even a point probably, to producing these babies. Probably fifty percent of the inquiries that I get are for a pair. Right. I want I want a pair. Can you sell me a pair? I'd like to buy a pair. Uh, or I want three females and one male. Everybody has this magic number in mind that the perfect combination is one male and three females. Yeah. Well, I won't argue with that, but keep them separate. But right. people don't, that's not what they want. They want to keep the male in there. They want him to breed as often and as many times as he can and produce as many eggs as they can so they can get rich selling little tortoises. Yes, there's always uh, money at the end that everybody thinks. Money is, is always at them. the end, and, and, and I, I, I got away from that part of it a long time ago. You yeah. know? So are you reluctant to sell to somebody when they're looking for a pair or for a trio or something, or do you kind of do a little bit of an interview with them to figure out what their motives are? Yes and yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> Simple as that. 
Simple as that. Uh, I probably have a, a, a little bit of a reputation as being a little bit difficult sometimes. Um, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I do this because I love the species. I want to see people take the time like I have and create their own breeding colony. I don't care if it's the size that I have. It only has to be a, you know, a small group, but I want to make sure that they, they have the right habitat. I want to make sure they're not putting the thing in a 10 gallon aquarium with a 200 watt light bulb over it. And then yeah. yelling at me because the animal died. Uh, I asked for uh, pictures of enclosures. You know, show me a picture of your enclosure. Uh, what experience do you have? And you would not believe the answers that I get. It's crazy. I'm sure. I, mean, the I, raised, is I raised two geckos and I know everything there is to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah, delete. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, and and I try to be polite. What do I do? I guess I left it inside. Um, everybody has the phone, okay? Yeah. And the, and the phone is the Bible. Yes, you know, uh, the, their their iPhone. You know, the iPhone has all the answers. And I said, well, maybe no. Maybe the iPhone doesn't have all the answers. You know, what's your experience level? Yeah, people are always wanting to just jump into things and and uh, without thinking about it. And I, I was just talking to somebody last week for the episode that I'm going to push out in a couple of days, talking about as a breeder, almost looking for the customers you want to sell to. And I think that's really important. You know, like you interviewing them and making sure that the animals are making it to the right homes, so we're perpetuating yeah, the species yeah. properly. Yeah, and it doesn't matter whether it's a tortoise or a snake or a lizard. You know, that part doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I, you want them to go to a good setting. I want to know how you're keeping them. And and then if, well, I don't want to, you know, again, I don't want anybody mad at me, but uh, it, it's crazy some of the things that, that have been sent to me. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. I have to kind of politely say, no, thank you. You know? Yes. Yeah. And that's your job. You you don't have to sell any of the tortoises, right? You I don't have to all. sell a one. Yeah. And and I have a very good rapport with a lot of private collectors and breeders uh, around the country. And it is not uncommon to just ship them to here. Yeah. Here's, these two are different bloodline than what you have here. I just sent them to uh just because I wanted to. Yeah, exactly. So as far as just to wrap up on the breeding side, was there any other sort of challenges that you had to overcome? Was there anything that you learned? You already talked about kind of pairing the males up and getting a little bit of antagonistic behavior there. Was there anything else that you learned along the way? Uh, well, I learned about incubation and humidity. Hmm. And uh, there's this... Uh, you know, this temperature sex determination deal, uh, you know, everybody wants females. And so for years I was incubating at a certain temperature and it seemed like I was hatching a lot of males. Uh, in the beginning, that was fine because males were in demand. Males being so small uh, that they were dying off a lot. Right. They stress very easily. These these are these animals are very susceptible to stress, especially males. So I've I've played around with my my incubation parameters, and and I think I have it dialed in pretty good to hopefully produce more females. We shall see. It's a it's a it's a work in progress right now. So is that temperature? goes up to, to hit more females or, or do you drop the temperature? The temperature goes up okay. to produce more females. Um, I, I can see, I can see some changes in the, in, in the, in the hatching, the hatching timeline. Right. Uh, you know, I'm not a fan of trying to create something 
at the price of something else. I don't want extra scutes. It happens. It happens under any condition. You know, it can. But I don't want to be. I don't want to be the cause of it. If it if it occurs naturally, so be it. Right. But but I don't want I don't want deformed animals. I don't want you know hatchlings with five legs or three eyes or something like that. I, yeah, it's yeah. important to me that they're, they're healthy. So I, I, I have to be cautious how I do this. Yeah. You still want to be within the band of the natural incubation yeah. temperature, yeah. what they would experience in the wild. Yeah. yeah. And, and I've been, uh, I've been, I've been fortunate. I've been very fortunate in that aspect so, so far. Anyhow. So as far as your other tortoises, what else do you have? You don't just have Egyptians. What else is on the property? Uh, well, 99% of what I have is in this room. Mm. All right. This is my, my tortoise room. It's a, uh, it's, it's part of my garage. I put, built a partition in the garage. So it's a 10 by 20 room. My other tortoise passion, if you will, is, uh, Pixis, the, the, the spider tortoises okay. from Madagascar. Yeah. And I, and they're also small. And they're also highly endangered. So I got involved with them also, the first group I got 10 years ago and uh, and raised them up. And they are just now starting to produce eggs. I have yet to hatch one. They have a very difficult, well, for me, it's difficult with a diapause involved to, to, uh, to hatch their eggs. They produce one egg at a time. That's it. Wow. And anywhere from one a season to three or four a season, but it's one egg at a time. And it's a huge egg in relative, uh, in, in relationship to their size. So they, they are a challenge then. And I guess that's kind of probably why part of the reason they are endangered. is They, 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 uh, yeah, they're highly endangered. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, their natural habitat is, is being, challenged hourly yeah and so uh but i got involved with them a number of years ago with the uh, pixis arachnoides arachnoides that's the the common if you will common species um and i also have a few uh pixis uh, arachnoides bragui that are approaching breeding age and i also have some planticata that are they have a few years to go, but probably four or five years to go before they're at breeding age. Okay. So that's a nice little uh, group of species there. And if you're working with, it's nice that you're aiming towards those endangered animals. And as far as the hobby goes for people who are keeping tortoises, do you think, because this, I always find tortoises are, are almost like the big snakes in some ways, as far as like the reticulated pythons and the Burmese, where you see a lot of people caring for having sulcatas and, you know, huge tortoises that just completely outgrow them and outlive them. And where is your opinion on, on keeping tortoises in the hobby? What species do you think work well and and which ones, or do you even agree that maybe sulcatas should be kept or shouldn't be kept? Or where do you sit on that? Well, the whole sulcata thing is, is becoming a big issue right now. Yeah. Uh, Sadly, yeah, they breed like rabbits. Number one, they have huge clutches and they have multiple clutches. Um, so all the turtle seller retailer guys love them because they're they're quick and easy. Yeah. Uh, go to any of the go to any of the expos and you'll, you'll you know you'll see dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Now in Florida, they're a problem because that little cicada now is 18 inches long and, and he, and he can't stay in the 20 gallon long that the, that the pet shop told him was perfect for him. Yeah. They put him out in the yard. He digs his way out of the yard. Now he's roaming around. So it's, it's, it's become a problem. The way I approach it, I, I don't look at them as pets. You know, it's not a pet tortoise. Mm-hmm. It, I, I have a goal. My goal is to keep these species alive. They cannot survive in their natural habitat anymore because man has taken away 
their natural habitat. So, so I'm trying to create my own little world here and hopefully work with other private collectors to perpetuate the species, both the Egyptian and the Pyxis. And it's, it's becoming increasingly gratifying to, to learn that there are others with the same passion. They're not interested in the dollar aspect of it. They just, they just like breeding them and keeping them and, 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 and growing their own colonies and working with other private collectors. Pretty soon, these things will probably just disappear from the public because, which is a shame, I guess. But most of the public wants that instant gratification of buying the little pet. Look what I have. And if it dies, so be it. Yeah. And that's where the cicada is at, you know? Yes. Yeah. Well, I think I, I love the conservation angle. And like you said, there's actually a lot of people who are involved with keeping any species of reptiles who are part of that sort of mindset, who are, are more concerned about the the well-being of the animal in general overall like across the planet type thing and that was part of the reason that i started the podcast is because i was you know i was thinking about the the reptile trade from that sort of sulcata mindset where i'm like we're all just sort of consuming we have these animals but are we actually doing anything beneficial to them or is this 100 percent selfish on our part and i think there is a lot of selfishness to it but we can do things like participate in conservation in any way whether that's assurance colonies or supporting conservation for land protecting land and whatnot so we can actually have a benefit to the species that we keep in our homes sort of their wild counterparts which i think is a really important piece to to knit together yeah i i would agree um i've kind of i mean i'm all about conservation but i've kind of i hate to say it thrown in the towel Mm -hmm. when it comes to conservation because I know down here in Florida, it's, it's, it's a, it's a hotbed. It's a political hotbed. If there's an acre of land down here, somebody's dying to build 25 houses and a shopping center on it. And, and they will bulldoze anything in its way. Right. Uh, the gopher tortoise is a, you know, it's a hot topic down here. Um, so what I've kind of done is gone more in the, in the direction of preservation. Right. All right. I can't, I can't fight the government. I can't fight other countries. I can't, I can't, like, I wanted to, you know, we jokingly said we wanted to release 50 Egyptian hatchlings back into the wild. That can't happen. You know, it just can't happen. So I'm trying to preserve what is left. So that's, that's the mode that I've taken and others that I deal with um, have that same mindset. That we're in a, we're not so much in a conservation mode, we're in a preservation mode. Yeah, it's that sort of invisible Noah's Ark situation where we have pockets of these animals left on the planet. Thankfully, what, you know, unfortunately they're not in their native range, but at least we can do something to sort of reverse what other humans are doing to their environment. Yeah, and, and the more people I think that get, uh, again, I don't want to take away from the conservation aspect of it because it's very, very important. But I think the more that can can get into the preservation mode and say, and I don't care if it's, you know, little tortoises or tigers, you know, uh, as long as you do it right, the yeah. key is to do it right. And and uh, that's what I've tried to do here. I've tried to do it right. I've tried to design everything with the, the animal's best interest at heart. You know, I try, I have a vet that comes in you know it's kind of like on the payroll i want i want uh, she's a trained exotic specialist and and i i just stepped back i said all right you know look them over you tell me you're the expert you know i can make sure to eat well and all that but you know the the biological part of it go for it (laughs) yeah exactly well and and kind of like you alluded to at the beginning the purpose and the more you get more enjoyment out of this process than just caring for the pet tortoise. Like you were saying at the beginning, you had a few pets and and you kind of got tired of just feeding them. And now you have this greater purpose and it gives you more responsibility and and more enjoyment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Very rewarding. Very, very rewarding. I, uh, I, you know, people say you're selfish, you're, uh, you're, 
you know, you're just trying to make a lot of money at it. Trust me, I, I, I spend a lot. I, I have 24 UVB fixtures. Okay. Yeah. 24. So just buy 24 fixtures. How much is that? Yeah, exactly. Now, all right. Now each one takes a, a, a UVB lamp times 24 and, and they don't last forever. And so, uh, the, the next step is to, is to measure the UVB. And I bought a meter, you know, the, the solar the meter, $300 meter to measure the UVB. I mean, I try to leave no stone un, uh, untouched, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when people think that, uh, that, that's why I always sort of laugh when people try to get into reptile breeding to make money is, you know, it's, it's very difficult and you're going to be spending a lot. And especially if you want to do it right and do it right by the animal, then, you know, there, there's not a ton of profit to be made. It's just breaking even in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah, they, these little guys are very expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, I charge a lot because, not because I can, but I want to separate the the real dedicated keepers from the, you know, the Sokata keepers. Yes. Yeah. You know, you want a baby tortoise, go buy a Sokata for, you know, sixty nine ninety five or whatever. Down here, people give them away. I mean, they're everywhere. That's crazy. Well, or, or red think... foots, you know, red foots or a dime a dozen. You know? Yeah. Well, and, and the other thing to, to highlight is in making money off of the project that you're doing, there's nothing wrong with that either. Like we, we want to make sure that the people who are putting the time and the energy and the effort to make sure things are going right, that there is some profit on the side because you put tons of time into this and and we want to reward that. Her, herpetoculture as a whole should want to reward people like yourself. I would think so. You know, uh, I put every dime, not every dime, but I put a lot of back into this, like I just yeah. mentioned, the lights. Um, I mean, add it up. You know, somebody has a calculator with 24 UVB fixtures and 24 bulbs. Yeah. That's a lot of money right there. <laughs> exactly. <you know>? Yeah. <laughs> well, the UV uh, or the uh, solar meter should save you some money, I think, because you should be able to get some it, more it life. It already those has. Bulbs. And, and there's another thing, you know, yeah. People were saying at first, every six months, change the bulbs. And then they said, well, every 12 months, you could change the bulbs. Well, you didn't know. Most yeah. people just don't know. And so I I, uh, I bought that meter and immediately went around and checked everything. And it was I was astounded at some of the readings. Some were high, some were low. I felt I had to raise lights and lower lights and all that just to uh, to compensate, to keep it in a, in a, a certain range that I felt was acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how much that meter will illuminate. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to touch on before we, we wrapped up one kind of goes sure. back to, to husbandry and, and that's pyramiding. And, you know, as a non tortoise keeper, we always hear people talking about pyramiding. You, you see it as sort of a, a sign of bad husbandry, but it, as far as I'm aware, it's one of those question marks. People don't necessarily know exact, exactly what's causing it. It's either obviously nutritional or something in captivity. What are what are your thoughts? Well, several factors. Here, first off, I have a bunch of hatchlings right in front of me. All right. So there's a perfect uh, perfect shell. Nice and smooth, and 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 and. No pyramiding, right? Yeah, round. Yep. Still eating. <laughs> Munch, <laughs> munching on yeah. a piece of lettuce. Yeah. Um, humidity, hydration, a natural diet. You know, don't feed them commercial stuff. Yeah. Don't overfeed them. We have a tendency to overfeed them. Um, the right lighting, a place to hide, a humid hide. Uh, you can't see it, but the, the hatchlings all have a, just call it a plastic bucket that's turned upside down with a hole cut in it. And on top of that bucket, there's a, a terracotta dish full of water. If, if I were to raise the, the bucket up and look underneath, the underside of it would have condensation on it. Mm -hmm. uh, all those factors. Yeah, you know, just take them all and combine them. So yeah, really, it's just an overall husbandry issue. Yeah. You got to hit all these points. Don't make it too hot. Don't make it too cold. 
they need a hot spot to process, you know, to warm up and process the, the uh, digestion. They need a, a, a cool spot so they don't dehydrate. It, it's all the above. Yeah. Interesting. So l- let's wrap up and finishing about the Tampa Bay Turtle and Tortoise Society. So I think, w- were you part of the, the group that started that? Or you could tell us a little bit about the origin story. I actually that. founded it. Oh, you founded it. Okay. I, it, it, what happened was uh, originally there was another tortoise society over in central Florida that we that I belong to. And then we formed a chapter of it in the Clearwater area. And logistically, it was a it was a two, three hour ride one way to attend their meetings. Mm. So I said, man, this is and it was a, a weeknight. So I said, wow. this is getting this is getting kind of old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Six hours of driving every week. Yeah, six hours of driving <laughs> for an hour and a half meeting, you know, or something like that. So uh, so we came up with the idea of of just forming our own group. And and uh, so I led the charge and I said, let's let's form our own group. So we formed the Tampa Bay Turtle and Tortoise Society. Uh, we incorporated and then uh, I, I set it up as a, a 501c nonprofit and, and things were, were clicking along real good. And we had a, we, we formed a, a Facebook page. Now I didn't do that. Trust me. I, I had somebody help me with that. And, and things up until COVID, we were running real strong. We were running real strong. I must say COVID has probably affected everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, no longer could we have uh, face-to-face meetings, uh, which is a shame. So I, I, uh, I actually run our our Zoom meetings. Okay. We have a we, we have a monthly meeting on Zoom, and and I try and get different speakers in. Just only yesterday, I heard the announcement that they relaxed the rules as far as the masks and all that jazz for COVID. So we'll see what happens. Maybe we can get back into it. But it's a group of, you know, turtle and tortoise people. Um, you know, the idea is to meet as a group and 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 discuss what you have and try and uh, help people, educate people. You know, we get young people that show up, school age people. Mm. Myself and another guy um, who's also part of the the group and also part of the Herp Society that's in the area. Uh, we would go to schools. We would go to uh, summer camps and do uh, presentations. We drag snakes and turtles and whatever, stand in front of you know a group of 30, 40 kids. Yeah. Sometimes we go to senior homes. Seniors are actually quite receptive. Oh, that's I great. have to watch how I say senior now. I kind of fall into <laughs> that category. but uh, <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I mean, I think those are those, and I think that is one of the shames of COVID, like you're saying, is the face-to-face meetings. Like Zoom is a good alternative and a good substitute, but it's not the same as being with the people and, and going to schools and communicating with kids and letting them you know, hold an animal and and sort of that concept of mentorship as well sort of disappears when you're just doing it virtually. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's hurt and it's hurt a lot. I mean, it's hurt a lot of people, a lot of organizations. So there's no, no argument there. Uh, what we would do every year is um, we had an auction and, and I have developed a great rapport with some of your, uh, your, your big vendors, the zoom meds and the Zillas and uh, uh just to name a couple, a lot of the locals, and they are very generous with donating product. And so we would have a, an annual auction as a fundraiser. And then as a 501c3, uh, on the flip side of it, we look for projects that we feel that that we as an organization can, can help support. Um, a couple of years ago, the TSA was was overwhelmed with that huge radiated tortoise confiscation in Madagascar. Uh, thousands and thousands of them were confiscated. I'm sure you've heard of that. And yeah. So, you know, we were in a position to to donate significantly to that. We have several 
uh, rescues in, in Florida, turtle rescues. And, and they do uh, a phenomenal job, especially with the gopher tortoise. The gopher tortoises that are hit by cars and, and cracked open, you know, most of them just get kicked off to the side of the road uh, and, and die. And this, this, uh, uh, this rescue will take these animals and, and, and patch them up and heal them up. And some even get released back into the wild. Mm. Uh, I mean, to the tune of they have 24 or more injured gopher tortoises at a time. And it's all done on a voluntary basis. So we donate to them. You know, uh, now the big thing is red ear sliders and sulcatas. Right. People are unloading these things in droves. They've all bought the red ear slider, put it in a 10 gallon tank. Now it's eight inches long and it's still in a 10 gallon tank and they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So they, they just want to get rid of it or they let them go. We obviously, we don't want them to let them go. That's so we, uh, you know, they wind up in these rescues. Right. Well, I mean that it's incredible how much you can do. And that's what I love highlighting societies like that and individuals like yourself who are actually taking some responsibility for herpetoculture and trying to do what they can to make it better and, and mentor people. And, and that's great. Are there any other future projects that you have on the go or anything that you have coming up that, that uh, you want to share, or are you just focused on the Egyptians right now and, and the society? As far as I'm, I'm tortoise wise myself. No, this is the extent of it. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of, I mean, I have a Spengler eye, but I have one yeah. and I only have one because one, I only have room for one. He has to be kept inside because of the temperature requirements. Right. Spengler eye require much cooler temperatures. So I have it set up in the house with the AC on and, and, and it, it works much better there. I only have one because of my affiliation with a few other individuals like Anthony that have large groups of them. Right. And, and, uh, and I try and help them. I mean, I, I, I had one and I sent it to Anthony and I said, send me a, send me a hatchling, you know, to entertain myself with when it gets a little bigger, I'll probably send it back to him yeah. and he'll send me another one. Cause he has the breeding program. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I don't, um, I have a, a 20 gallon breeder, over here that's set up as a aquatic setup that I have a little Florida mud turtle in. Um, as a, I volunteer at a nature park and people come in all the time. We found this crawling across the yard or in the driveway. What is it? What do I do with it? And they bring in yellow bellies or they bring in these little tiny baby musk mud turtles about the side of a dime. Wow. So I'll raise them up here and then I take them down to this park that I volunteer at. We have a 200 gallon freshwater uh, exhibit with just native Florida baby turtles. Oh, cool. Yeah. That I maintain. And I put it, I put them in there until they get to me maybe three inches long and then we'll, we'll release them into the, there's a pond, big pond on the property. We'll release them in there. Oh, that's great. See, that, that's what's awesome about Florida is just reptiles and turtles and tortoises everywhere. <laughs> yeah, 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 there are. And, of course, the downside of that is construction is out of control. Mm -hmm. And so you'll drive by an area that's two acres of beautiful wooded land or fields or whatever. And the next time you drive by it, there's 85 houses and a gas station going up. And the, and the road is lined with carca carcasses of squash turtles or tortoises. Yeah. So there's the depressing side to it. That's the downside of it, you know. And there are regulations in place that are supposed to address it, but they figured out how to circumvent all that stuff. So Yeah. There's always loopholes. Yeah. Which is a shame. Well, 
Ralph, I really appreciate you spending the 75 minutes here with me today. We, we covered so much. And I, like I said, I really love to highlight individuals like you. And, and hopefully people get excited thinking about the idea of you know having a little more purpose behind their keeping and, and getting involved in a society and whatnot. And, or even working with a species that's endangered. Because I think it really is the one thing we can do to, to make sure that the hobby is doing less damage than, you know, more, more good than damage. We'll put it that way. Is there, is there any way, I guess, as far as your online, people can find the society on Facebook? Is that, that's about it, right? Yeah, just Facebook. Yeah. Okay. I'll put that um, in the show notes. We have a, we've had a, 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 an email that's been, or a website that's been under construction forever. So it's, I don't think it's even operating yet. I don't okay. know. I have a look at, but just Facebook. That's all. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes. And then uh, you've been on the podcast a couple of times. So I'll throw that in there if anyone wants to hear uh, more of your story and more of uh, what you're up to. And so thank you so much, Ralph. This was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. And it's nice to be able to get the word out there. So, uh, All right. That is the end of that episode. Ralph, thank you so much for sharing all of that wonderful information. I assume and I hope that some of the listeners are inspired and want to start a similar project with an endangered species. So any of those high level keepers out there, this is an opportunity for the hobby, for herpetoculture, for us to get involved in conservation on the ground floor. You know, there's nothing stopping us from creating these, you know, pseudo species survival plans within the private collections or within the private hobby. So if you are at that place where you want to do that, I would love to hear about it. And I think the example Ralph kind of walked through in this episode should be a good roadmap for you. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed it, make sure you share it on social media or Facebook. If you want to pick yourself up an Animals at Home t-shirt, head to animalsathome.ca slash shop. If you want more information on this episode, you can find that at animalsathomenetwork.com. If you would like to join us on Patreon and have early access to episodes or the opportunity to submit questions to upcoming guests, head to patreon.com slash animalsathome. And as always, thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for supporting this show. You can find affiliate links in the description box as well as on the show notes. And as always, if you do make a purchase through that link, a small commission does come back to me, which absolutely helps me run the show. All right, everybody have a great week and I will talk to you next Sunday.